Okay, well, um, something happened there with the camera, but I uh, don't know what happened. But anyway, we're back on. Shalom, shalom. Baruch Avon Kevarim. Welcome, friends. We are in the 33rd week, the 33rd week of the Hebrew Alephet, God's spiritual pathway. And we are studying the letter Ayin today, the letter Ayin. Ayin is the 16th letter in the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 letters in the alphabet. There, Ayin is the 16th letter. It is the number 70, the number 70. It's used for the number 70. So instead of writing 70 like I would, they would just write the letter Ayin, and they, uh, they would uh, interpret that as 70. So letters are not only are they uh, the letters of the alphabet, but they're also numbers. And then um, many of them, most of the letters are also words. And th this is uh, a word as well. Ayin is also a word. And Ayin is a word that means I, I. Now this is the uh, modern way of writing the Ayin. And the uh, long, long one coming around, and then the shorter one on the left. Now, there's a difference with the Zayin, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the Zadi, because the Zadi uh, will come down and it will come more like that, and then a shorter one on the right. So you can see they look similar, but they're very different. They are different uh, in, in many ways. So maybe it, that's for not confused. All right, go. Oh. Now, it, it means I. This is a picture of the pictograph that Moses would have written the letter as, and that would have been the picture of the I. And the interesting thing is that the modern Hebrew that, uh, that came about <clears throat> after the Babylonian captivity, uh, if you look at it, it almost looks like there are two eyes right here that are connected to an optic, optic nerve and that uh, that optic nerve goes back to, to the back of your head. Now, <clears throat> technically, what you, you don't actually see with your eyes. Your eyes are lenses. You're actually, the, the, the picture that you are uh, looking at or the object that you're looking at is actually transmitted through this optic nerve, and the, it's at the back of your head where the um, you're actually seeing. You're actually seeing back here, not here. Now that's very important because while we know that scientifically now, they certainly did not know that in the day of Moses. But yet God specifically commanded a certain thing, uh, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, but before I do that. Um, Ayin spelled out is Ayin Yud Nun. That's a Nun Sufi. That's the ending letter of the Nun. It takes a different kind of form at the end. So Ayin Yud and Nun, and it means I or fountain. I or fountain. And the interesting thing is, is that when you take the uh, seventy plus the ten plus uh, the uh, the fifty of the Nun, when you add that together, that's one hundred and thirty. And 130 is the same gamatra as the word ladder. And the only time a ladder, the word ladder uh, in Hebrew where the ladder is used is in Jacob's ladder, where he saw with his eyes, the i.e., he saw the angels going up and down on the ladder, and he saw the ladder. Uh, it's an interesting connection there between the word ayin and a scripture story. But I want to go back to this uh, optic nerve. Uh, Jewish people wear a, a tefillin. Uh, um, in the New Testament, uh, the Brit uh, the uh, word is actually um, um, phylacteries, the Greek term for it is phylacteries. And, but the tefillin that they, the, it's a box that they put on their head and they, they strap it, they wind windings around their arms and around their fingers. And uh, and all the way down, and this uh, so they are following a directive that is over in Deuteronomy that's, that God had said 
that the that the words that they that he speaks will be as um, be, be as frontlets between your eyes. So why do they put it at the top of the head? They put it up here where the baby spot, soft spot would would normally be, and they they, they place it right here, right just before the just before the hairline. And uh, it's very interesting that they've been doing this for centuries, and only recent only within recently compared to you know 3,500 years ago. Uh, they, they've they uh, come to realize that this optic nerve is what brings the pictures all the way back to the back of the head. And so you're actually, your eyes are actually, you have eyes in the front, but you also have eyes in the back. And so you have this, these two sets of eyes. You have the eye that that uh, that is the lens, but then you also have the eye that you see with on the back of your head. There's also two kinds of eyes that we talk, we talk about a physical eye and also a spiritual eye. Um, the spiritual eye is insight and and uh, that type of um, that type of idea, uh, a spiritual uh, insight, uh, being able to see spiritually. Um, the the interesting when when um, when the, we had the sin of the Garden of Eden, uh, Eve Chava had looked on the tree and saw that it was good for food. And she took of it and she ate. And it says the eyes were opened. Well, you know, she wasn't blind before, so it's not a physical opening of her eyes, but her own eyes were open to the spiritual world. The eyes were open to the um, not the spiritual world of, of good and the spiritual world of evil. And so um, uh, open up a Pandora's box, if you will of the calamities on this earth. But nevertheless, um, so that's kind of interesting how that how that is. But the um, so that uh, the film that they put on there uh, literally sits uh, there between the uh, between the eyes. So when they're placing that they without even realizing they were doing it, they were actually putting that the film between the eyes. Between the physical eye and their spiritual eye, their spiritual understanding. And that tefillin was sitting right there on the top of their head, and uh, of course wrapped around their arms as well. All right, so um, um, the tefillin. All right, so uh, so that a little bit about that. Sixteen and seventy. Uh, we're going to look at um, uh, the word. Seventy is interesting because seventy is the number of sacrifice. 70 is number of sacrifice. Well, this is really good because 16, and we're going to, so I'm going to, I'm going to connect 70 and 16 here because the 70 is the, the picture of sacrifice. Watch what 16 is. 16 is written with a yud and a vav. Well, the yud is a hand and the vav is the nail. We have sacrifice and we have the nailed hand. The sacrifice of Yeshua upon the cross. The Yud also means a mighty deed, and the uh, the ball is is a connecting, is a connector. It's a nail. It connects things. Um, it, it's used for as a prefix in words for the word and. So they put it put it in, uh, in the beginning of a Hebrew word, and it will be the word read the word and. So. Uh, many times when you see it evolve at the beginning of the word, most of the time it's going to mean and, all right? So, and so the the deed of the nail, the deed of the connection is love. So what what prompted the action? What prompted the yud to be nailed? It was love. It was love that put him on the cross. And so sacrifice and love is connected. And so uh, love made the sacrifice and we have 70. Now here's the interesting thing. I'm gonna come back I'm gonna come back to the 16 and, and the idea of love here in a moment. But what's this we have love connected to 70 through the to, through the number 16 and you have uh, there are 70 nations that were listed in the table of nations there in Genesis just prior to the uh, Tower of Babel. And you have the uh, 70 elders, the 70 elders that went up onto the mountain with, with Moshe and, and they, they sat down 
and they ate with God. They ate with God. So um, Moshe wasn't the only one that got to go up and, and be present with God. There were 70 elders that went up there as well. If you'll remember when they came back down, Eldad and Nadab were prophesying to the camp. And uh, God and they, they, people said, well, Moses, you need to stop Eldad and Nadab from prophesying. And he said, I would that all, God, all God's people would, would be prophets. I would, they wish they would all prophesy. All right. Now, now the, out of that 70 elders comes the uh, concept of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was 70 elders in Israel, and they were the, they were the judicial part of the, um, of the uh, Jewish economy. We have 70 years of exile in the Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And so they were 70 years in exile. You have, you have 70 holy days in a year. 70 holy days. You have 52 Shabbats. 52 Shabbats. You have seven days of unleavened bread, which is unleavened bread, um, Pesach, uh, Passover, and first fruits. Okay? Of the Quran. All right. Then you have um, uh, one day of Shabbat, Pentecost, and 50 days after after unleavened bread. And then you have one day of Torah, the Feast of Trumpets. You have one day of the Feast of Atonement, Yom Kippur, which is today. Yom Kippur is today. Uh, and then you have uh, seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. Sukkot. Seven days of Sukkot, and that's coming up in just about five more days. Then you have uh, the last great day after the last great last after the seven days of Sukkot, there is the last great day of the feast, and they do a water libation to bring water, and they pour it out. And this is the day that Yeshua stood up in, on that last great day of the feast, and he proclaimed, "If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink, and out of his belly will flow rivers of living water." And so, uh, if you total this up, fifty-two, seven, one, 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 seven, and one, it comes to seventy. And so there are seventy actual holy days in the year. All right. So uh, now let's go back over here. I was talking about this being sacrifice and how sacrifice is, is connected to love because the the action of that is God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now the uh, the the word love is interesting because uh, on a talit, I'm wearing my talit here that my wife made me, um, that I lovingly call my my uh, coat of many colors. But uh, this is uh, this is a, a talit, and uh, these are the zizi. This is the zizi that's on the corners of the talit. Now there are four corners of the talit, and each corner has a zizi. And each of these zizi is four strings doubled over. So if you counted the strings hanging here, there's eight strings. One string is the tehelet string, the, uh, the blue string, string, but the rest, and then but the rest of them, there are eight strings. But they're in reality only four strings. They just they just appear as eight because they're doubled over. So you have four strings, and four times four is sixteen, which is the sixteenth letter of the letter ayin. And isn't it interesting that the commandment is to look upon the tzitzit, to look with your eyes upon the tzitzit. And there's a reminder to look in the very fact that there are 16 threads on the four corners, and that would signify ayin. But remember, these threads are doubled over, so there are actually eight threads that, that are visible that you'll actually look at. And so you have eight times four is 32. Well, it so happens that the, that the the word for heart in Hebrew is the word lev, and lev, lamed beit, is 30 plus 2 equals 32. And so it is the heart of God, which is his love. And so the, the, uh, the 16, which has to do with the, the nailed hand, which is sacrifice, is, comes from the heart of God and is shown here in the in the uh, seat, seat that is on the talit, I write about uh, of, of the talit in this book, the power of the prayer shawl, 
the story, I'm sorry, the story of the Preshaw. And uh, it's a teaching tool sent by God as seen in scripture and in modern history. And so I go through the scriptures and I show the places where the Zitzit is referenced. Uh, you, will, you will not see this in your King James. You have to see this in the original Hebrew in order to be able to see the Zitzit in there. And, um, but, uh, and then I also go through modern history. I go through uh, how the, the Zizi became the flag of Israel. And I'm not the Zizi, but the Tadi, rather. The Tadi became the flag of Israel. Uh, and so I talk about how that came about. And that is quite a miracle in itself. Well, in the process of that, I talk about the story of their independence, those, uh, the 1948 and the, the war for independence that they had. Uh, and how that came about and how that uh, all, all about the talk about Zionism a, a little bit in here and what that what that entails and I and you know there's just uh, uh, all through, all the way through the um, the Tanakh uh, which was most most people um, are familiar with being called the uh, Old Testament that's really a, a poor um, a poor choice of words but uh, it's uh, the Tanakh as uh, anyway and the uh, uh and, but it's also in the Brit Hadashah, the uh, the new covenant, the renewed covenant actually, the Brit Hadashah is a renewed covenant, not new covenant, it's renewed covenant. That's very interesting. All right, so that uh, that gets us over here to some of the words that we will see that have Ayin in them. Uh the first word we're gonna look at is the word Aden. Aden. Aden is the garden of Aden. Gan Aden. Gan Gan is garden. Aden is Eden. So the garden of Eden is Gan Aden. And uh, here we have Aden. Now, if we look at Aden and we look at the picture, you know, we have the eye, and then we have the door, and then the noon is uh, the uh, means life. And so, literally, you 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 uh, uh, you see the three pictures there, and so you can say this to see the door of life. So in Eden was where they saw the door to life. They saw the door to eternal life. They had the tree of life in there. They saw the way, the door. The, 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 all they had to do was protect the tree of life. They would live forever. And that was the door, to so see the door of life. But you can also divide it this way. You could divide it with here. And and then you would have the ayin, which is to see, and then you would have the word din, din, d-i-n, din, and din means judge. Um, the um, the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Dan, uh, they called him Dan because God will judge. And so uh, Dan or Daniel, not Daniel, was God will judge. And uh, so the din is is judge. So it literally means to see the judge, to see the judge. Well, who is the judge of all the earth? Elohim. And where where did they see, where was man seeing uh, Elohim? They're in the garden. And so the name tells us uh, about the place and what that place does. That place is the place where we see the uh, the judge when we perceive him when we understand him, when we come to a realization of him. So we can have our own garden, Garden of Eden, in our own lives, in our own home. All we have to do is begin to see the judge, begin to see him, begin to know him, begin to know God. And it creates a veritable Garden of Eden within our own life and eventually into our own family. And that goes out into our workplace and then into the uh, city and the world if we just simply apply the same processes all the way through. All right, another word that, that has a I-E is the word Ivrit, Ivrit. And Ivrit is the language of uh, the Hebrews. A Hebrew is an Ivri, and Ivrit is the language. So we speak Hebrew, and that would be Ivrit. Uh, the the Beit, Resh, Yud, and Tav spell the word Brit. 
and Brit is the word for covenant. So a Yivit is a person who sees the covenant, who understands the covenant, who perceives the covenant. Those of you that are that understand now, we know that 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 the word Hebrew, Ivrit, uh, comes from a word to mean to cross over, and we know that that's the root of the word. But I'm talking about the meanings of each individual letter of that word. So to come to cross over is also not just not just to cross over, but to have an understanding of the covenant. So it's a it's a spiritual insight into the covenant. And when you when, so there is a there is a process of becoming a, a Hebrew. It's not just a one-time event. It's a process because by the letters of it is to see the covenant, okay? All right, then you have uh, uh, the uh, Dama. Dama. Dama is weeping, to weep, to weep, to cry, to weep. And this weeping is this effulgence of tears, like a fountain of tears, right? Which is another word for I, by the way, I, by the way, is fountain. But this fountain of tears, this weeping, the, this dama. Well, uh, if you take the dam, that means blood, and the ayin is eye. So tears is, are the blood of the eye. It's the blood of the eye. Hebrew is so amazing. All right, then we have the word shema. Shema. And <clears throat> you are familiar with this with Deuteronomy chapter 6, where it says, uh, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, he is. Uh, one, one Lord. All right. In in Hebrew, it's uh, Shema, Shema, Shema Israel, uh, Elohim. All right, Elohim. All right. So it goes on uh, to and and watch this now. Shem, Shem means name. Shem is name. So Ayin is to see the name. So the word Shema means hear, listen. But it also means to hear with the with the uh, 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 with the corresponding action at the same time of hearing. In other words, as you're hearing, you're doing. As you're hearing, you're doing. Uh, the idea behind uh, hearing in the in the Hebrew mind is you haven't heard unless you've done. Unless you have responded in action, you haven't heard. Uh, I know in our Western mind thinking, we think, well, if I if I am able to write down write down what I've heard, then I've heard it. If I've been if I'm able to um, you know repeat it back to somebody or to record it in some fashion, then I then I've proved that I've heard it. But that's not what the word means. It actually means to hear with a corresponding action as you're hearing. So. It's a it's a it's a connection with between the two. Um, it's a quick obedience. Hear, hear, O oh Israel, Shema, Shema, and it's command. Shema, 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 Israel. Those uh, Israel is those who struggle with God. I, I could teach on the the Shema right now, but I, I'm trying to not do that. Uh, but uh, it's to see the name. To see the name. So when you see the name, when you see the name of Yahweh, when you see your head, when you understand it, when you have a spiritual understanding of the name your head, when you you Yahweh, when you when you begin to understand who he is, you begin to see him and you begin to uh, uh, to to enjoy him. That's another idea about seeing is enjoyment to enjoy him. When you get that relationship with him where you're enjoying his presence, you're enjoying him, and you're beginning to understand him, and you're, beginning to, you're beginning to know him better, and you're beginning to uh, have, a, have a deeper and deeper relationship with him, then that is, that is to see the name. And so when you have that relationship, it's very quick to respond because you, the, my sheep know my voice. And when, they, when you hear him speak, you are acting immediately. Why? Because you know him. You know that he would not say one thing that would lead you into pr trouble. So you are you are very eager to to obey every word that he speaks to you. And so hear, O Israel, Shema, Shema Israel. 
uh, the Lord, our Lord, our God, he is one Lord. Now, um, the, there, there's a, that, that Shema that we're talking about is very interesting because in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, the first uh, word there is Shema, and it ends with the letter Ayin. And that Ayin in the Torah scrolls, are, is uh, the Masoret, uh, read, read this text, uh, is a uh, very large Ayin. It's, it's huge. It's written very large. So why was that? Well, there, there, there are a lot of comments about, about why that Ayin uh, might be large. But one of the reasons that I believe that I am is large because God, God wanted us to God wanted us to take notice that that of that I am, and He wanted us to see with our ears. Because what do you hear with? Shema means hear. So what do you hear with? Your ears. You don't hear with your eyes. But He is pointing out the I am because He wants you to take a spiritual perception of what you're hearing and hear with your eyes. In other words, visualize what you're hearing. Visualize the word of God working in your life. Visualize the end result of what that word is speaking to you. Visualize it. Get a visual picture. Put it onto the screen of your mind, and you place that picture there, and then you move toward that picture. Now, that's using your imagination to be able to do that. But you have to use your imagination. You have to take what he's saying and put it into a picture and put it down into your memory where you see that action. And then you move toward that action. You move toward doing that thing that you're seeing yourself doing long before you do it. All right. Uh, without a vision, my people perish. That's what I'm talking about, a vision, creating a vision, taking the word of God, creating a vision and seeing that come to pass in your life. All right. Now, that's some good, good teaching right there. You, you just take a whole sermon just on just what I talked right there. But there's, a, there's this, this Shema at the end. The, the last word is the word Echad, which means one. And in this particular place, it uh, it, it intent it's uh, uh, not not so much an, uh, a compound unity, but it, it actually means one of a kind, a set of heart. In other words, God is God is there is none other like Him. He is He is Echad. He is He is uh, uh, without without comparison. There's nothing that can compare to Him. So there uh, there are no other gods. You if you look at the context there, they're about ready to go into uh, into Canaan. Uh, as a new generation that, that did not know the gods of Egypt, uh, they basically have only had one god in the wilderness. They haven't they haven't been uh, exposed to a lot of gods. But now they're going into a land that has a plethora of gods. And Moses uh, and God wants them to uh, to understand that He is unique and that there are no other gods like Him. There are no other gods before Him. There are no other gods that are. That, that, that can even compare to him. He is incomparable. He is, he is set apart. He is outside of everything. He is beyond all of our understanding. He is beyond our comprehension. He is, he is more than what we could ever hope, ask or hope for or, or even think about. He is more than what a man could create with his own two hands. He's more than the gods of, of Canaan. He's much more than everything. He's the creator of the, of the heavens and the earth. And he is outside of creation. He is not part of the, uh, the creation. He's not a tree. He's not a mountain. He's not a he's not a piece of wood. He's not a, a a stone that's been carved out. He is God, and he is not a man that he should lie. But he and neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not said, and shall he not do it? God is God, and there is no other like him. All right. So Yahweh is one. So to see with our ears. Now, the interesting thing is when they say the Shema, they cover their eyes. <laughs> they cover their eyes. Now, there are many reasons why they cover their eyes. But one of the reasons they cover their eyes is because of this ayin right here. Because they want to picture what they're hearing. Shema, Israel. And so they picture the meanings of every word. Israel is the, is, uh, it was, was came out of a struggle with God. And 
A true Israelite is a person who struggles with God. He struggles with the concept of God. But here, oh, you who are struggling with God, and you, you paint that picture in your mind as you cover your mind. Shema Yisrael. And they say it, say it slowly. So you're, you're picturing what you're saying. You're picturing, you're putting a motion picture in, into your brain about, about those things. And then you go to each word. And each word, you know, you let the spirit begin to give you revelation and give you perception and give you, give you understanding and insight into each word as you are saying the Shema. And so that's why they cover their eyes because they want to hear with their eyes. They want to hear with their spiritual eye. All right. Now, that last letter is, the, is a very large dalet. Echad is spelled with uh, alet, chet, dalet. And that dalet at the end is very, very large. And so you have a large ayin at the beginning, and you have a large dalet, uh, dalet at the end. When you take the two letters together, the ayin and the dalet, and put them together, it forms a word. It forms the word aid, aid, and aid means witness, witness. So if I were if I were going to um, if I were going to make an agreement with you, I would take a pile of rocks and I would and I would call that uh, aid. That is a witness between you and I. And uh, so uh, so that's so the the old uh, way of of doing things would be that way. So. Uh, Shema is very interesting. Ayin is, is, uh, is there. There are some words that we're looking at. Now, I want to go through, uh, through, I uh, talked about Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 and the anomaly of the large Ayin there. But I also want to look at Psalms 80 verse 13, about Psalms 80 thir verse 13. And it talks about a wild boar coming out of the forest. Uh, the King James says wood, uh, which is just another name for forest. And it, this wild boar comes out of the forest and it devours the Israelites, all right? Um, and so, uh, but right where, where it says, where it says that it comes of, uh, of, the, of the forest or of the wood, that word of the forest or of the wood is written with a uh, ayin that is written above the other letters. It is, it is suspended above the other letters. So why is that? Well, <clears throat> the interesting thing is, now it's written like this. Uh, the mem is a prefix, uh, which means of or from. And then you have uh, ya, ya, ar, ya, ar. So this is me, ya, me, uh, me, ya, ar, me, ya, me, ar. And so uh, this me, ar is a word that, uh, that means of the wood or of the forest, all right? And so this boar, which is a wild pig, Hazir is a pig, Hazir. And so uh, this is a wild pig, a wild boar. Uh, they have tusks on them. They're very, uh, they're very bad animals to deal with. And so uh, they, the, the rabbis looked at that ayin and they said, the ayin is a silent letter, and the alef is the uh, silent letter. There's the only two silent letters that are in the Hebrew alphabet is the alef and the ayin. They only make a sound when there is a vowel connected to them. And so the, the, um, uh, the, they, they say because they're silent, that it might be possible to substitute them. Now, um, I, I don't, I don't, we are commanded not to do that. But nevertheless, they are playing with the language uh, in a, in a uh, philosophical and a spiritual way. They're not actually making the changes. They just look at it from this standpoint, that if they look at that ayin, and that, that ayin, if that became an aleph, you would have the word your, your. Yar, and yar is a, one of the words for river, one of the words for river or brook or stream, a, a yar. This yar, river, 
is uh, is interesting because they're saying that that I the iene it represents Esau Esau okay this is Esau that's Esau and Esau had a a um, uh, one of his descendants was Amalek Amalek now Amalek was the one that came uh, he was the first one to attack Israel when they came came uh, uh, you know into, into the wilderness and it was unprovoked uh, they weren't even they weren't even going to um, bother uh, the, the, the Amalekites but they they attacked them anyway but when they attacked them they attacked them from the rear and they went after the weak and the stragglers the ones that were in the weak in the back so it was very cowardly very cowardly action on their part and, and God said there will be war with Amalek forever and um, so anyway I, I, there's a whole a whole line of teachings on Amalek and how how that uh, we've seen we've seen that all through history but the when they when they said that they struck the ones in the hinder hindermost the word there is, that's used for that's pronounced uh, that's uh, translated struck is also is is actually the word that means cool down it cools they cooled them down <laughs> So the rabbis say to this is that the spirit of uh, Amalek is the spirit that says, just cool it. Just don't be quite as religious. As, uh, don't be so. Don't be so much of a fanatic. Don't don't get into this. Don't don't you know? Just just it's it's okay. You know you can go to you can go to uh, you know you can go to you know the the different festivals and things like that if you want, but. You know, just don't get too involved in it. Uh, it's okay, you know, to learn the language if you want to, but you know, just don't, don't, don't go into all the these you know, things about the letters and stuff like that. Don't, don't get too involved in, in everything. Just kind of, you know, take it easy. You know, there's a, there's a big world out there to get involved in, and there's a lot of things, a lot of activities. My goodness, you know, there's football games to go to, there are basketball games to go to, there, you know, there's, there's, there's Sunday night football you've got to watch on TV. And you got to know all the stats of all the football players. And goodness sakes, you won't have if you do all that. You won't have time uh, for for Torah. You won't have time for the for for the Word of God. You won't have time for it. So you know, just just cool it. Just cool it a little bit. Enjoy life. You know, enjoy yourself. And so they said that's the that is the spirit of Amalek. And uh, in a Christian understanding, we understand Amalek is the battle that we have with the flesh. And and isn't that true? The flesh wants us to cool it. Flesh wants us to not get so involved with with, with Yeshua. The, the, it says the flesh doesn't want us to become spiritual. The flesh wants us to be uh, stay carnal and go after carnal desires. They, they the flesh wants to control us. They don't want to be spirit controlled, and so that's it's the spirit of Antichrist wants us to cool it down, to cool it down. But here's what they said: if you will win the battle against Amalek, win the battle against the flesh, then the then the forest becomes a river. And guess this now. In the forest, a boar can do you a lot of harm. But in a river, the boar will drown. He can't do anything. And so you defeat the boar. You defeat the Amalek. You defeat it by doing the right things and not cooling down and by staying hot for God and eventually you defeat Amalek and you erase his name forever out of your life so that's uh, that's interesting all right one last thing we're going to talk about in the book of the Lamentations Lamentations Echa Echa and Echa uh, is uh, is the book of Lamentations and um, the um, the in the uh, there is a couple the a couple, of, a couple of chapters there are acrostic, uh, acrostic. There are uh, each each verse is alphabetical, but in chapters two and chapter four, uh, those those two are, are acrostics. But in those two, uh, the the pay actually comes before the ayin. The pay is the next letter that we're going to be studying uh, next week. But the normally it would be uh, uh, ayin and then pay, but here. The pay actually comes before the ayin, 
is pay and then ayin again. And it looks like there was a mistake. Uh, and, and maybe the verses were reversed. But no, they weren't. Because God is wanting us to, to, to take notice of something. And because the book of Lamentations is about the destruction of the temple. And when did the destruction of the temple happen? On the 9th of Av. In fact, on every year, the 9th of Av, the Jewish people read the book of Lamentations. In fact, they pray it. And they, they cry and they, they lament every year. Uh, and they weep profusely uh, over the temple uh, being destroyed. And it was destroyed on the first time on the 9th of Av. It was also destroyed the second time on the 9th of Av. And then they're interesting. So the ninth of all is very interesting to them. There are a lot of things. But they also say that the sin of the spies happened on the ninth of all. And that that sin of the spies is what caused all of these other calamities to fall upon the ninth of all was because of the original sin of the spies. And the reason they say that is because it's the limitation gives us the clue here because it's putting the pay for the ayin. The letter pay, which we will find out next next week, but the letter pay is the word for mouth. Pay is mouth. Ayin is eye, pay is mouth. So literally, this they're saying that uh, that limitation is telling us that in this story of the destruction of the temple, that is the, the, the reason is because somebody put the mouth before the eyes. <clears throat> The mouth before the eyes. So putting the mouth before the eye is the sin of the spies. Sin of the spies. Now, what do you mean by that? In other words, they went into the land to spy, right? To spy with their eyes, to look with their eyes, but to look not with physical eyes, but with spiritual eyes. Only two of them had spiritual insight, and that was Caleb and Joshua. And the, Caleb and Joshua were the only two that came out with a good report. The other ten spies all went in, but they began to talk before they saw. And then they created a vision in their head of what they were saying. And so they, they, they said, we are like grasshoppers. And we are even grasshoppers in their sight. Now, did they actually go ask somebody? Did they ask, people, ask the giants of Anakim? Or did they go over there and ask them, uh, how do you look at us? No, they, they, they created that picture in their mind. And so they, they got their mouth before their eye. I want to tell you something. We need to get the spiritual understanding and the spiritual perception, the spiritual revelation, and then make our mouth come out with that spiritual revelation, regardless of what it looks like in our natural eye. Because that is, we have to look at things with the eye of faith. But once we see that in the eye of faith, then we speak what we see with the eye of faith, not with the eye of our of our. our of our physical eye, but the eye of faith, the eye of our understanding, the eye of our perception. And the eyes of our understanding be in the light, and that we would know the hope of our calling, that we know the height and depth and breadth and, and, and of God's love. All right? Uh, anyway, um, so, so, but you know, the interesting thing is that after, after God had, had uh, talked, you know, talked to them, and um, uh, literally, you know, totally, they, they cried, <laughs> and, um, you know, but they were crying for nothing because they, 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 their tears didn't, didn't solve anything. And so as a result of that, they had to wander 40 years in the wilderness, one for every day that the spies were in the land. So they had to wander around for 40 years, 40 years of wandering. And so on every Tishbiah, on every ninth of Av, they, the Jewish people, they cry, they cry. Because this crying is crying that they believe will actually accomplish something. Because tears are cleansing agents for the eyes. It clears up our perception of the world around us. It clears up of our perception of our actions. 
And when we cry, it clears our, it takes it takes away and cleanses the eye. Tears are a cleansing thing for the eye. And so they are reversing the sin of the spies. That's what they want, are doing on, on the night of all when they are crying. And the interesting thing is, is that, and I'm going to leave, it, leave, leave us with this thought. Does our sin make us cry? Do we perceive the immensity of the action that we've done? Do we comprehend and do we understand? Do we have a spiritual understanding and spiritual insight into what that sin was doing to not only ourselves but our family and our and our our acquaintances and our people that we that we love so much is do we really have that kind of feeling inside of us about our sin that it makes us cry that it makes us weep and our tears flow like a fountain for the sins that we've done because the crying cleanses us and makes us able to see clear again and to not do that sin again. This powerful tool that God has given us called tears is something that we should allow ourselves to, to be part of because it's such a part of, of, of this process of, uh, of, of uh, restoration unto God. All right, so I'll leave that, leave that with you. I hope you do get my book. Uh, I've got a link there that you can uh, that you can click and get that. There's also a link where you can uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and you can view all of my teachings on that YouTube channel. And by clicking on that link, you can just subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can see all 33 weeks uh, of, of the teachings so far, and then the rest of the rest of the teachings as well. Uh, my wife makes this beautiful talates that uh, and, and she's made this one uh, on, on mine. She put a painting on there, which uh, is an additional uh, cost. Um, but uh, you can get a you can get your own uh, personal talit that uh, you can pray under. And if you get the book and understand what this is all about, you will want to do that. It is a wonderful thing uh, to own is your own personal tally. So I'm, I'm going to uh, hopefully you'll connect, contact me and I will put you in contact with my wife and she can order the tally. So I'll leave you with the priestly blessing. Yavarataka Yahweh Vishmaraka Yaer Yahweh Panav Elaka Vikunaka Yisa Yahweh Panav Elaka Via same. Licha Shalom. The Lord will bless you and he will keep you. The Lord will make his face to shine upon you. He will be gracious to you. The Lord will lift his countenance upon you and he will give you peace. Shalom. Shalom.